on Halloween morning, a truly grisly scene is revealed. As a family's bodies are strewn about, as if they are Halloween decorations themselves. But that's only the beginning of how truly heinous and grisly this story gets. Halloween is scary, but reality is truly terrifying. What you are about to hear is believed to be real. Based on witness accounts, testimonies, and public record, this is Terrifying and True. On October 31st, 2010, 16-year-old Devin Griffin's eerie discovery in his Oak Harbor, Ohio home, which initially seemed to be just another Halloween joke, turned out to be life-changing in the most horrifying and heartbreaking way possible. Halloween is known for its playful pranks, but what about the cold-blooded murder of not one or two, but three people? belonging to one family, the murderer also a member of the family. This is the horrifying true story of the Lisk family massacre, and that's our topic tonight on Terrifying and True, so get yourself a pumpkin roll to take down the edge on this one. We're going to get right to it after these quick words from our sponsor. It was Halloween, 2010, when the residents at 7052 North Ohio 2 in Sandusky, Ohio, would become the site of a devastating crime. Devin, age 16, returned from his Sunday morning church service to a quiet house. Settling into his upstairs bedroom, he started playing video games on his computer, like any other day. Little did he know, that day would go beyond his wildest nightmares. But it wasn't until around 1.30 that afternoon that he sensed the disturbing stillness enveloping his home. To check up on his family, he went downstairs and started to search for his mother, Susan Lisk. The master bedroom unveiled Susan and her husband, Bill, still nestled in bed beneath a maroon comforter. Moving around the bed to Susan's side, Devin tapped her protruding leg and pulled down the comforter slightly to try and get her attention. It was then that his eyes fell upon the pillowcase that was soaked in blood. In that disorienting moment, he contemplated the possibility of his mother pulling a Halloween prank on him. But as time passed and he was unable to wake his parents up, it dawned upon him that this was no Halloween prank. Lying in front of him were three very still, dead bodies who would never see daylight again. But murders like these don't just happen overnight. Well, in some way they do, but there are almost always some very troubling stories behind criminal acts like these, and this case has one very intriguing yet very troublesome story as well. And to understand it, we need to take a detailed look at the family dynamics of the Lisk family. This journey to find out what caused this gruesome murder takes us back to northern Ohio, where Lake Erie's massive shores stretch across four U.S. states and Canada. As many of you may already be aware, northern Ohio is renowned for its natural beauty, offering lakes, plains, and national parks, making it an ideal escape for the outdoor enthusiast. Notably, Cedar Point, the second largest amusement park in the United States, is also located in this region and is a perfect family getaway for most. However, by now you can probably tell that our story today does not revolve around amusement parks or leisurely activities. Not even close. Instead, we venture into the quiet, sparsely populated area of Martin, Ohio, where the Lisk family resided. This household was home to William Billy Lisk, 
his wife Susan Lisk, and their three sons, Devin, Derek Griffin, and William Lisk Jr., known as BJ. The Lisk family led a seemingly happy life deeply rooted in their religious and rural community. The boys attended church every Sunday and were actively involved in the church choir. One of their cherished pastimes was hunting, taking full advantage of their home's vast 100-acre property, which they used for many outdoor activities like walking, hiking, and fishing. However, like many families, the Lisks had their secrets. Behind the facade of happiness, a darker issue lingered, a troubling childhood that haunted William Lisk. William's early years were marked by aggression and defiance. He often bullied other children and frequently got into trouble both at school and with the law. His parents initially dismissed his behavior as typical childhood mischievousness, hoping he would outgrow it, and that as time progressed, he would turn into a responsible young adult. When William was 15, his father, Billy, met Susan, who would become his stepmother. Despite their newfound love, William resented Susan's presence in his home, and their relationship deteriorated over time, so much so that William's aggressive behavior only escalated and worsened, and he faced increasing challenges both at school and with law enforcement. At the age of 17, William even physically assaulted Susan, leading to felony charges. His violent outbursts and lack of respect for authority continued, eventually resulting in a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. Consequently, he was placed in a group home for mental health patients in Sandusky, near Lake Erie. Although receiving treatment, William remained a danger to others, and he had several encounters with the law during his stay in the group home. His family, particularly his father, continued to support him, but tensions within the family persisted. William's disturbing behavior extended to harming animals, a troubling sign in the world of psychology. Regardless of this, Billy tried his best to be a good dad to his son and often took William on trips to their family cabin in Carroll County, hoping to provide him with an outlet for his troubles and bridge the divide within the family. However, William's mental health deteriorated further, leading to his hospitalization in 2007. Soon after, Billy applied for guardianship to ensure William received proper care. He recognized the importance of medication, but William's inconsistency with treatment hindered progress. Despite his efforts, Billy could not fully control his son's behavior. After returning home from treatment, William's relationship with his family remained strained, and then came the dreadful night in October of 2010, when Susan, Billy, and Derek were all found dead in the family's home. So now that we have all the background information of events that led to the crime scene, let's dive into the details of what happened after the bodies were discovered and Devin contacted his Aunt Lori, who promptly dialed 911. The crime scene that the police arrived at was, as you can imagine, one of extreme brutality and violence, with a claw hammer identified as the murder weapon. Upon examination of the house, the police were also able to trace some muddy footprints, which suggested that the killer had fled the scene. The family vehicle, a Ford F-150, was missing, and this raised suspicion toward William, who had encountered Devin in the house that morning. William was found at the family cabin in Carroll County, captured by surveillance footage during his journey. He was arrested and subsequently charged with multiple counts of aggravated murder. Despite his initial denial, William ultimately changed his plea to guilty in exchange for the removal of the death penalty from his potential sentence. Something important to note is there is a rather intricate tapestry of events that led to these killings, all of which started long before that ill-fated Halloween. Official police reports trace BJ's issues back to early 2002, when, at the age of 16, he was placed under house arrest. This marked the first instance when Bill had to summon the police to their home. 
BJ had been expressing threats of self-harm, leaving his father at a loss on how to intervene. When the police arrived, BJ turned violent towards them. By 2004, BJ's behavior escalated from self-harm threats to attacks on others. That October, he had a physical altercation with his stepmother, Susan, resulting in her being hit. In the subsequent months, he faced multiple charges of criminal assault and robbery for striking Susan and stealing her car keys. However, he was deemed unfit to stand trial due to incompetence, leading to the charges being dropped. At the time of the murders, BJ was no longer residing at home. His father had ordered him to leave the house after he attacked Susan while she was showering. This incident prompted BJ's hospitalization, during which time he received treatment for schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder. Despite these challenges, Bill Lisk persisted in maintaining a connection with his son, often visiting him at the halfway house where BJ was residing. In the week preceding the murders, Bill took time off work to spend it with BJ. They went on a deer hunting mission to the family's hunting cabin. Their return occurred less than 24 hours before BJ would perpetrate the unspeakable act against his father. Investigations suggested a chilling sequence of events. Two different murder weapons were used, a blunt object and a firearm. Detectives theorized that Derek was the first victim, as the fatal blows from what appeared to be a hammer wouldn't have woken up Bill and Susan from their sleep. No shell casings were left behind, indicating deliberate cleanup by the killer. There were no signs of forced entry or robbery. A neighbor reported hearing disturbing noises, potentially gunshots, around 6.30 a.m. on Sunday. Initial inquiries centered on Devin, but he was soon cleared as a suspect. Devin recounted seeing BJ in the driveway at his house before the church concert. BJ, seemingly loading something into his father's white truck, was informed by Devin that he'd be back shortly. The focus then shifted to BJ Lisk, whose relationship with his stepmother Susan had been fraught with tension since her marriage to his father. Witnesses disclosed a history of confrontations between the two that escalated to several physical altercations. When police eventually tracked down BJ at the family hunting cabin in Carroll County, the cabin and its surroundings underwent thorough searches in the quest for potential murder weapons. Deputy Mike Balish of the Carroll County Sheriff's Office recalled, quote, We knew we were looking for at least one blunt force object. We believe at that time it was a hammer, and then we're looking for a small caliber gun. Critical evidence, including blood in a 22 caliber rifle, was discovered in the white truck. Inside the Lisk residence, investigators stumbled upon a bloodied hammer hidden in a closet. According to prosecutors, Lisk used a claw hammer to fatally attack his stepbrother before proceeding to his father's bedroom, where he shot his father five times in the head. His stepmother also fell victim to three gunshots to the head. Traces of physical evidence indicated that his stepmother had been sexually assaulted by Lisk either just before or after her death. B.J. Lisk was then formally charged with murder with DNA evidence linking him to the crime scene. During a jailhouse conversation with his mother, B.J. confessed in a poignant moment stating, quote, I wasn't in my right mind. He then abruptly ended the conversation with, Mom, I can't talk about this anymore. As shared by Detective George Byington of the Ottawa County Sheriff's Office. In a courtroom filled with friends and family who cared deeply for his father, stepmother, and stepbrother, William B.J. Lisk faced the difficult task of explaining why he committed the brutal murders of his loved ones last October. Holding back tears, Lisk, 25, spoke his truth. Quote, I had a lot of love for my dad, and every time I think about what I did, it churns my stomach. I can't fully explain why all of this unfolded, but I believe my mental struggles played a major role. The judge in the Ottawa County Common Pleas Court, Bruce Winters, acknowledged that while the court 
couldn't mend the pain or bring back those lost. Its duty was to strive for justice. As a result, Lisk was sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole for taking the lives of William E. Lisk Jr., 53, Susan Lisk, 46, and Derek Griffin, 23. Prosecutors and defense attorneys had a consensus on Lisk's life imprisonment, avoiding the death penalty. Lisk admitted guilt to three counts of aggravated murder out of the six he had been charged with. While there was substantial evidence that could have led to a death sentence, the decision took into account Lisk's age and history of mental health struggles. The reaction of both the Lisk family's relatives as well as police officials and detectives involved speaks volumes about the intensity of the situation. Lisa Curl, sister of William Lisk Jr., addressed the court, expressing the permanent alteration of her family's lives and how the senseless tragedy had robbed them of their cherished family members. She struggled to comprehend how such a devastating event could occur, leaving them with profound pain and loss. Prosecutor Mark Mulligan shared his impression that Lisk's acceptance of responsibility meant a great deal to the family. While it couldn't provide a satisfying explanation for the tragedy, it did offer some form of closure. When asked if she was content with the case's outcome, Lisa Curl responded, quote, I'm just glad it's over. In March of 2015, at the age of 29, BJ was found dead in his cell from self-inflicted wounds, bringing an end to a tragic chapter. Prosecutor Mark Mulligan, reflecting on this chilling case, stated, quote, This was the most disturbing murder scene I'd seen throughout my career, and I can still see it to this day. This case truly serves a poignant reminder of the complexities of mental health, the challenges faced by families dealing with mental illness, and the devastating consequences it can have on not only the family, but also the community at large. Talk about a heavy story to head into Halloween with. Not only is this a truly tragic story of mental health and family strife, but it takes place in my home state of Ohio. For those of you new to the show, that's where Weekly Spooky HQ is, in sunny Dayton, Ohio. Ohio has many fascinating pieces of urban legends and folklore and unfortunately some truly ghastly true crime. If you don't believe me, just look up the Circleville letters. Yeah, we did an episode about that you can listen to if you go to our archives at weeklyspooky.com. Boy, I want to take a moment to say something I think deserves to be said. William Lisk Jr., the father of the family, he was a hero. He had a son so deeply troubled that he was assaulting family members, that he was truly unhinged in many ways, and he refused to give up on him. Unfortunately, that refusal may have been a catalyst that allowed this to happen. But William Lisk Jr. was being a good father, spending time with his son. They had just returned from a hunting trip the day before the ghastly events of this story. William Lisk Jr. was a great dad, a man who cared so deeply for his children that he stood by them even when it was definitely not easy. So that's what I want you all to think about right now as you listen to the show. Let's all hope we can be as good as William Lisk Jr. was. Terrifying and True is narrated by Enrique Couto, executive produced by Rob Fields and Joshua Butler, produced by Daniel Wilder with original theme music by Ray Mattis. If you have a story you'd like us to cover on the program, send us an email at weeklyspooky at gmail.com. And if you want to support us in a very direct way, go to weeklyspooky.com and click on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can support us and allow us to keep the spooky rolling and rolling and rolling. And I want to say a big thank you to our Patreon podcast boosters, folks who pay just a little bit more to hear their names at the end of the show. And they are Johnny Nix, Bobbletopia.com, Megan Hua, Julia Kirsch, Brent McCullough, Steve King, Karen Wiemet, Jack Kerr, and Craig Cohen. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time right here on Weekly Spooky and Terrifying and True. <laughs>